at a young age, I grew up in the South side of Chicago. My father was in construction and, and honestly, like most children, I, I didn't understand what he did um, day to day. But at a point uh, in my life, when I was about 19 years old, I, I was able to work with him uh, when we were, he was working on a construction project with the new Comiskey Park being built. And what I observed is uh, a, a person who walked around, was quiet, thoughtful, who was the superintendent of that job. And, and really what he did is he enabled the employees and the teams of people from various different groups to, to construct uh, a monolithic arena. And he did that without raising his voice, without being autocratic, by helping people when they were in a situation where they couldn't help themselves, he would work to make sure that that things were addressed and problems were solved, whether he did that himself or connected the dots. And I, and I was able to observe that. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammond. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Everyone's heard the term servant leadership, but how do you actually become a servant leader? So we thought I'd have a conversation with someone who made the journey from, you know, sort of not having an alliance or a principle of leadership, just showing up, getting work done and, and being a manager into them becoming a servant leader. So today we look at the journey of becoming a servant leader with a CEO of 66 Degrees, fast growth company on the ink list, but they are really impressive. We talk with Matt uh, Question. Uh, he is um, he really a smart guy as it relates to understanding how to align people. And if you want to align people and, and get the right principles and strategies and frameworks, this episode will help you figure out how to do that. Now, my journey is to help you be the most powerful leader you can be. And a lot of things get in the way of leadership that we just aren't willing to face. And so if you're listening to today's conversation and you're thinking, I'd love to level up uh, my own leadership, or I'd love to level up the leaders within my company, I'd love to have a conversation with you about what's going on there. Because inside that conversation, I not only will serve you by putting a spotlight on the things that are getting in the way, I've been doing this for a decade, and I'd love to help you figure out what that is. And if that's the end of our relationship, so be it. But I, I feel like I've served you powerfully if that's all we do. But if we have a conversation about your business, we identify what's getting in the way, you have a plan, you might ask me to help you. And I'm willing to, to explore what that looks like. Um, it really is what I do for a living. It's what I do for my life mission. And so I'd love to help you become a more powerful leader. And all you have to do is go to genehammett.com and schedule a call. Inside that moment, we will just dive into what's going on with your business. What's really uh, the vision that you're trying to create? What's really getting in the way? What's the blind spots that you can't even see? Because that's what I do over and over and over for the last decade is helping founders and CEOs do this uh, with just grace and ease. And it really is my life's mission. So if you want to join me for that call, it's absolutely free. Just go to genehammett.com and schedule a call. Now here's the interview with Matt. Hey, Matt, how are you? Doing well. How are you, Gene? I am fantastic. Excited to have a conversation with you today. Before we jump into uh, the journey of servant leadership and, and how you got to this place that drives your business forward, give us an idea of your company, 66 Degrees. So we're a company that is exclusively focused on Google Cloud. And in, in a nutshell, what we do is we help our clients modernize their infrastructure, applications, data, and day-to-day -day collaboration platforms while doing it all securely. Um, so we're, we're a professional services organization, also uh, with some resale capabilities in terms of licensing product. Well, I think a lot of people are looking at collaboration across the line and, and Google products are pretty amazing for what they are and for in as ex inexpensive as they are. Where do you see the future of cloud work like you're doing over the next five years? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be transformational. Like what we're seeing, what we've seen is kind of the first wave of people just moving general infrastructure and, and managing costs and operation and getting more flexibility. But what we're seeing is this data-driven cloud capabilities, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, the ability to analyze and get answers to questions um, that we probably haven't even thought about doing before. I mean, imagine imagine driving your car um, today versus 20 years ago. Now, now your car tells you where it's going and it predicts the routes effectively. That is the trend. Things are moving more to that and more to that enablement. Um, and the cloud is really a vehicle to, to power that. Beautiful. I, I, I'm excited about this transition. We use Google Clouds quite a bit. 
I know it's not the level at which you're doing with the security and, and, and everything, but uh, I'm really a big fan of what they do and have allowed us to do with a, a distributed team. Um, mm -hmm. Asynchronous work has become an, an, a normal part of everything. And, and this is just a really powerful platform. So Matt, I'm really excited to have you here. Um, when our team was doing research about your company and, and the impact that you've made, um, it all comes back to leadership for us. You have embraced servant leadership as a, as a kind of a central principle across the company, but what is the journey that got you there? So take us back to where you really started your leadership journey. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, it starts back with my father, actually. So uh, at a young age, I grew up in the south side of Chicago. My father was in construction. And, and honestly, like most children, I, I didn't understand what he did um, day to day. But at a point uh, in my life, when I was about 19 years old, I, I was able to work with him uh, when we were, he was working on a construction project with the new Comiskey Park being built. And what I observed is uh, a, a person who walked around, was quiet, thoughtful, who was the superintendent of that job. And, and really what he did is he enabled the employees and the teams of people from various different groups to, to construct uh, a monolithic arena and he did that without raising his voice, without being autocratic, by helping people when they were in a situation where they couldn't help themselves, he would work to make sure that, that things were addressed and problems were solved, whether he did that himself or connected the dots. And I, and I was able to observe that. And then as I took, came to my career, you know, as, as, as all of us do, we start off as individual contributors. I was a very technical person. And, and at one point I decided, you know, it would be interesting and, and, and it would be something I would enjoy to lead a team. And as I started doing that, what I what I quickly realized is I I had some foundational values, which are treat people how you want to be treated. Um, and if you're a leader, it's about enabling the team because they're the most important they're the most important thing in the entire world related to a business. There's no doubt about it. And if you're not taking care of them, then they have a, they vote with their feet. And so when I look at when I look at great employees, they they figure things out. They work. Um, they're they're they hold themselves accountable. They're engaged. And where, when they come into situations where they, you know, they just need help, they, they need to raise, they raise their hands. And I think it's a leader's job to help them either through coaching or, or direct involvement. It's not taking over their job though. Uh, Gene, I know we were talking a little while ago. It's not about solving all their problems for them. It's solving the problems that they can't solve or, or, or requests that they're making to help them move faster that you, that you're the one that is capable of doing that. That's how I look at that. I also think that throughout my throughout my career, I've transitioned more into servant leadership than when I originally started, uh, and and that is just based on experience and, and understanding, you know, what were the teams trying to do, and and becoming more confident in the ability to step in and and in gaining more experience and and just helping connect dots. So, so for me, I think it's any any leadership style is a is a evolutionary process uh, that you go through. And, and th there's some interesting stories and, and trips along the way of that process that I've experienced. Now, Matt just said something that I wanna put a spotlight on. It's not about solving their problems. Now, what's interesting about this is before we hit the recorder on, I shared with Matt my own journey of becoming a servant leader and understanding um, what that was before there was kind of a phrase for it, but I got it wrong. And I had a coach that helped me see it for the, the way it really is. Here's how I got it wrong. I was explaining to my coach about what my day looked like and some of the, the fires I was putting out. And I mentioned this, that I felt more like a firefighter than a CEO. And we had a conversation around the fires that were going on and why I was doing it versus my, my employees. And she asked me this question, who told you you had to solve their problems? I said, no one did. But I thought that was the way I'm supposed to support my team. And she said, but if you solve their problems, when do they learn to solve it? And I realized I was robbing them of a moment. And so I share this story with you because that inflection point inside of my own journey as a leader was powerful. And I think about it today, I'm never trying to solve problems that they can solve for themselves. I will help them and support them and my team in any way I can, because I want them to be successful. I don't want them to feel stuck. I don't want them to feel fear, but I want to empower them in a way that makes them think about how to solve their own problems, because that is powerful leadership. I share this story of my own inflection point in growth, because I want you to see that you're not alone. I've been there. This was over 20 years ago. And now I help people with this all the time. And if I can help you in any way, make sure you let me know. The back to Matt. Well, we're going to dive into some of that right now. I want to ask you this. 
was there a principle of leadership that you had before you were would call yourself a servant leader? Was it? Was yeah, there I, I don't. Bring that? It, it's interesting because I I didn't even understand what a servant leader was when we first did this. Um, I think when you see good leadership, you kind of know it, but you don't really know all of the aspects of it. And I've, I've had the opportunity to have a really good mentors and leaders along the way. So I wouldn't say my style came in like I purposely had a style. I think when you first take on a, a team, in my case, it was a team of people who were just like me, meaning I had they, I had done that role before and I understood that role. And so I understood what they needed and they understood kind of my background. So there wasn't really a, a big change in one moment other than you realize over time what how you need to interact. Like one of the things I, as a leader at the beginning, I didn't really understand is is the idea of kind of setting out the the vision and mission for the team and how important that is and and because it provides clarity to them and and what i've wound up doing since even since 2006 when i first took over and began to evolve there's that the next thing after mission and vision became like the values and kind of the vital behaviors of the team and really since about 2009 i i've stuck with a pretty specific um pattern uh kind of when when we come in to, to let people have clarity around kind of what 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 we expect as a business as a company to work together and it's, it's all centered on that mission vision values and um and kind of the vital behaviors as a team and they're very simple there's there's no it's, it's not magic it's just consistently doing things and having respect and integrity and accountability and and helping promote happiness of the team i mean ultimately at the end of the day we all have families we all have hobbies uh, we work sometimes because we're super passionate about it, sometimes because we pay the bills, but we should always try and make our, our folks as happy as we can make them while also getting the goals of the company achieved. And so, so there's just really common things that we try to put in place, place to ensure that. So we're talking here about you know, your journey to becoming a servant leader. And you mentioned these critical foundational areas that I think a lot of people know what they are, mission, vision, yeah. values. Maybe the, the, there's a little bit of unawareness around behavior. So I want to take all four of those things and just quickly unpack them. And, and maybe a challenge to do this in, in one or two sentences, but what is the mission? Not, not what is your mission, but why is it really important to have a mission that aligns people? Yes, no, it's, 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 I think it's very critical because what happens is a mission provides clarity. It, it tells you, hey, if it's not, if you're not aligning to these things, um, to, to enable our clients to be successful, you're not aligning to those kind of core fundamental pieces, then why do you do it, right? So that's, that's one thing, the mission. The, the vision is more about how and how we're going to kind of operate together. The values are just the fundamental pieces that we expect from each other. So I, I mentioned I mentioned a few of those, right? So, so the concepts of, of respect, integrity, accountability, those are, those are basic things that we should always expect. The behaviors are really, um, really simple. And, I, and the reason I do, the reason I share this, and I'll, let me explain, let me share a couple of them. The idea of behaviors, like our first vital behavior is do what you say you will do. It's a very common thing, but there's a lot of folks uh, who, who that's a fundamental piece that will break trust, right? Um, share and seek feedback uh, from the teammates, clients, partners. So really just be open to feedback because it's a gift. See things as they are, not as you want them to be. Embrace constructive debate and then simplify the complex. Those are like our six or our five vital behaviors. I think those are very fundamental and simple. They're powerful when you spell them out. Like these are the expectations of people on our team and how we interact with each other. I get the behaviors. How do you use them though as you lead your team? Yeah, so I think if you if you lay out the the if you lay out what the expectations are, and, and honestly, it's, it's also a dialogue. You you want to make sure that people agree with what you're saying. So these don't come up from from just myself. It's it's come up from the team, and then you leverage those in your conversations. I mean, it most people most most of the folks on this team are just amazing, amazing people, and um and by having the behaviors kind of laid out, they really have expectations of each other. So one of the things I've noticed with every team, especially high growth companies. There's the, you know, that the standard model, I think it's the Buckman model from the 60s or 70s, where you get go through this process of, of forming, storming, norming, performing, right? The, the, the problem that you encounter is how quickly can you get through storming? If you have vital behaviors and expectations of the team and they, and they say, hey, listen, we're here to have a constructive debate. We're here to share feedback. I think you move really quickly through those issues where some companies can get muddled down in those issues, especially as they're growing, because Everyone has their own perspective. And, and if you don't have a foundational set of behaviors, you don't have a way to kind of 
um, engage in a, in a conversation and have set expectations, you can become, it can become a battlefield um, where people are pointing at each other and, and saying, hey, it's, it's their problem or their problem. But the reality is we're all one team. It's everything that happens within the company is, is all of our uh, issues. And, and there's, there's great potential and value of us all working together. And there's, and there's negatives that happen if we don't. And, and I've seen uh, throughout my career, I've seen um, situations where you know those vital behaviors weren't followed, and, and th- th- while they seem so fundamental, if if someone doesn't do what they say they would do, and you expected them to do that, it impacts a lot of people. And so I think those are just very simple, mindful things to remind people of. And and I we we hold these out in front like a flag. We this is the first meeting I have when we kick off the teams. This is the values are what we show at every all hands. And when we say things in meetings, I will actually use the word like, hey, see things as they are, not as you want them to be. Like, this is the reality of the situation. Now let's deal with it. So hopefully I answered the question. I rambled a little bit there. <laughs> no, I mean, you give us some good context around this. I, I do remember something you said before we cut on the recorder that I want to make sure we highlight here. You've embraced coaching as you've developed as a leader. And I, I think you, you said you had in your early phase of leadership before you became founders and before you became CEOs, you, you've got a coach and the, the name of the coach is not that important. I mean, you can certainly share them if you want to, but uh, what did you get from that coaching experience? Yeah, it's, it's actually, I think a lot of leaders go through this. Um, and sometimes this is limiting. Like I, had I not had a coach in this situation, it would have been a problem for me. Um, let me, let me explain the context. I was, I was with Microsoft. Um, I was introduced to a leadership program uh, fairly early and they have a fantastic program at the time it was called Expo and then it was Leadership Bench. And as part of that program, they assigned a coach to you. And as part of that program, they also want you to step out of your comfort zone and, and stretch um, the different capabilities of yourself. And so I went from leading a very technical team of architects to leading a technical sales team, which is not a very big transition. But then they asked me to take on the role of the United States compete leader. Um, that's a that's a marketing and strategy job, which is very different uh, from what I was doing. At the time of doing that job, there was a lot of leading through influence. It was leading a different kind of team with different people in an area that I did not fundamentally understand as well, that, thus the development. And there came a point where, you know, the first, the first, let's say 30, 60 days in, you have exuberance of the new role. And then you hit the 90 day mark and you have this trough of despair because I, I had never been in a situation at that, up to that point when I felt like a bit of an imposter that felt like I'm not sure of what I'm doing. And I was very used to, to knowing that I was very prideful about my own capabilities in, in building and having a team in a, in a, this situation, you know, you, when you, when you run in that situation, you have this, this, there's this diagram of like complexity and ambiguity and job and your capabilities, your level and ability to, to handle that. And sometimes your job is, is too easy for your capabilities and you get bored. Right. In this case, it was the opposite. The job was very complex. It was new and my capabilities were low in that area. And I began just like, wow, this is, this is something, am I, am I actually doing the right thing? I talked to my coach because the symptoms of this is that, you know, you can't sleep, your head's buzzing a bit. You're, you're constantly like trying to stay ahead. You're working so hard. You're pulling in hours to keep up and learn that it's, it's just one of those things where you have to take a step back. And I had, and the coach had asked me one day, he said, how's it going? I said, to be honest, I'm not sure it's going great. And, uh, and at that moment, you, you, I just explained my symptoms and, and this person, I won't, I won't say their name, but because it, 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 was, it was good, but I'll, I'll refrain. But she kind of giggled a little bit and she said, listen, just so you know, that's a, what your experience is very normal. It's very normal. You are, what you're feeling, that pain that you feel, that, that anxiousness is, is you're stretching and building new capabilities in yourself. And, and it's just like working out, it's uncomfortable at first. And, uh, and she recommended, there were little things she recommended, like the reading the book, uh, it was a, some one of the one minute books, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, and she pointed out a specific chapter and I was like, wow, that's me. Like what I need to do is I need to get a, a framework on how I control this and how I get ahead of it and how I learn and how I'm not having to work 12 hour days, you know, seven days a week to keep up. And, uh, and, it, and once that happened, it was, it was almost like uh, within a week, it was like a light switch where I went from feeling uncomfortable to opening up and asking more questions because I, was, I wasn't asking questions I should have been asking because I was afraid I'd sound like, well, he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, to, to, it, it literally was, you know, I was, I was in that trough of despair and I just popped up out of it and it, it was fantastic. That, that experience actually, that doing that job is what caused me to leave Microsoft, not in a negative way, in a very positive way, because it gave me enough confidence to start my own business and to work with some partners on that. So it was one of those things like you go through this period of growth 
And it's, it wasn't something that I expected. I'd never had felt it before. If someone wasn't there to explain to me at that time what I was going through, I would have thought it was, would have thought it was me and, and unnatural. Um, and I think at that point, I either could have, you know, figured my way out of it and worked my way out of it and got comfortable, or I could have decided to leave that position and not gain that experience of working there for over two years after that. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really, uh, that, that to me, I changed my life. And with executives that I have, I recommend they have coach. Um, so we, and we, we do that at 66 degrees. Um, we have the ability to do that. And I also think that developing young, younger in, I, I should say young, early in career talent and helping them understand that these things are normal. And, and, and this is kind of a journey that you're going to be on if you're going to decide to be a leader um, is really important because oddly enough, all of the books I've read around leadership, very few of them deal with the times that you have despair as a leader or the or the unusual situations like how do you deal with not knowing what the heck you're doing when you step in a brand new role <laughs> right because everybody's there but it's really hard to admit that sometimes when you're prideful matt just said something really interesting he felt like an imposter i've got quite a few executive clients that come to me that say that some journey or some part of their business they feel like an imposter they feel like they're going to be found out that they're no longer able to keep up the charade Whatever your feelings are, this is natural. I felt like an imposter sometimes as I stretch myself, as I expand, and that really is the key. It is uncomfortable to expand beyond where you are today. And you know, our mind tries to play games on us with an inner critic and self-doubt that keeps us from growing the way we want to. And I have recognized this in my coaching. I've recognized it in myself. I recognize it in, in many places where I see it. If you feel like you're an imposter syndrome, you're not alone. But it is something that you have to address and you have to move through. You have to embrace this moment and, and figure out what's getting in the way. And it could be a blind spot. It could just be a, a faulty or limiting belief that you have attached yourself to. But you want to make sure that you are getting the support you need. Now, you may not be aligned to my work, or maybe I am the person to help you. If you feel like I can't help you, make sure you let me know. Um, but I just want to make sure that you understand that you're not alone. And back to Matt. I appreciate the look back on the benefit that you had from coaching. You know, I'm a coach and I work with a lot of leaders that are evolving and feel like imposters as well. So I think that's very timely for you to share your own experience, even though speaking very clearly and directly, I was not your coach. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was that was many years ago before we, we knew each other. Uh, Matt, I wanna give you a chance to wrap up today. We've been talking about the journey to becoming a servant leader. When you look at your day-to-day, -day, what do you think people don't understand about servant leadership that you could just put a spotlight on in, in maybe three or four sentences uh, to help us understand how you spend your time as a servant leader? Yeah, I mean, day-to-day, -day in terms of servant leadership, I don't know if people understand exactly what it means to be a servant. I think when, the, I think when people look at a CEO role, many times they think of that CEO is driving levers and things, but the reality is, we give direction. We help with you know setting strategy. We align people to those those strategies, and then we enable them to to do their jobs. And 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 when we align those teams correctly and and they're functioning, they're they they it becomes so much easier. Servant leadership though requires patience. Servant leadership requires accepting feedback, being really transparent. And so and sometimes that's uncomfortable. I'll give you an example of one of the things we, we do here. And it was also something I learned while I was at Google. We have a process of allowing people to ask an anonymous questions of anyone on our all hands call, any question, or provide feedback there. And now, as long as, as, long as it's respectful, right? <laughs> but, but anything's on the floor. And sometimes that feedback is, is direct and, and it, people might be like, ooh, that stung a little bit because maybe the company's not doing something as effective as they should. But honestly, it's the best thing that I've learned in terms of like, my time with Google, my time here, because it gives you the understanding of what's really happening in the business and allows you to really think about things like that are on people's mind that make their day-to-day -day lives better. Diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations, uh, conversations about hey, we disagree with the direction we're heading. Like those are conversations that are critical, but not always had unless you give a vehicle and safe, psychologically safe space. Being a servant means that you, have, you listen to that and then you have to decide how you react and what you do. If you're an autocratic leader, if you're a command and control, you probably wouldn't care as much about feedback. You'd, you'd say, well, you need to do what I want you to do. 
And, and to be honest, I, I, I've just, that's never been my style. It's not what I've seen from great leaders. Um, the, all of the best ones, uh, Janet Kennedy from, I worked with her four different times at four different companies is an example of someone who I, I think just represents this. Um, and she's currently the, the North American vice president at Google Cloud. She, she, she seeks feedback. She understands feedback. She, she holds a high bar for people's performance. She sets clear and achievable objectives and allows them to get their path to going there. She embraces constructive debate. And, and those, so those are, those are things for me that I just think are inherent to, uh, to being a servant leader. Incredible conversation, Matt. I really appreciate you giving us your insight, sharing with us a little bit about what 66 Degrees is doing and, uh, and really just talking about becoming a servant leader that, that we can learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. This was, I actually really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate it. Wow, what a great interview. I love having this conversation about servant leadership. I've shared with you guys some of my journey of, of leadership over the years. I've even shared a private story inside this about where I got uh, servant leadership wrong and so and how I corrected that to help you become a better leader. Now, my hope is that you've listened to these content because you want to level up. You want to truly evolve in some way. If you want to do that, let's have a chat about what's going on. Just go to genehammett.com and schedule your call today. It will help you uh, figure out how to grow the business and how to move forward. Just go to uh, genehammett.com and love to talk to you about what's going on. When you think of growth and you think of leadership, think of growth think tank. As always, leave courage. We'll see you next time.